Yo, what's up? Ugh. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mikey Likes You podcast. I am Mikey who likes. You are you who is liked. It is a question and answer, and I'm going to bring up the questions, and I'm going to answer them for you right now. As you can see, I'm doing it uh, outdoors. It's a bit of a change of pace, but I think it's kind of nice out here with my doggies. Waylon right there, Willie running around, guarding the farm. I'm watching through the kitchen window, a cat just causing chaos, breaking things. So here we go. <sighs> Farhad10 says, drop your skin routine, King. I don't have one, dude. I really don't. I, I appreciate you saying that because um, it means that maybe you think I have nice skin, but I, I don't really have a skin routine. Um, I shaved. If that, <laughs> if that means anything. Um, I try to eat a lot of collagen and skin healthy things. I drink a lot of water. Uh, put a little coconut oil on here and there. I'll put it on my face and my hair. That's about it. Extra virgin, organic coconut oil. And uh, treat myself well. I think that helps. Um, let's see here. Trey thinks, hello Trey. If you supplement with collagen, should you count that towards your protein goal since it's not considered to be a full protein? It's a good question, but yeah, you should. If Look, if something has a protein value, if you look on a packaging or if you were to look up the nutritional value of a certain substance, um, and it's an incomplete protein, meaning that the amino acid profile makes it incomplete. It doesn't have a complete profile. It still counts as protein. It's still dietary protein, and it should be counted towards if you're tracking your macros. That being said, you don't want to make that the staple of your entire diet because it is, in fact, incomplete. You want to try to highlight things that do have a pretty complete profile. That's why, um, you know, meat heads where the term probably came from, value red meat so much because the amino acid profile, specifically for you know metabolic health and, and hypertrophy, the, meta, the amino acid profile for red meat is fantastic. Waylon. Um, but uh, vegetable proteins, a lot of plant-based proteins are an incomplete protein as well as collagen. But where collagen lacks, making it incomplete, it actually helps because of the methionine and other amino acid profiles that it is very high in that typically animal protein, you know, the animal flesh is low in. So it does help balance things out. So really it's about combining proteins to make a complete dietary intake at the end of the day, not necessarily about one specific protein that you eat, but it is a good question. Marvelous Mazungu, uh, thoughts on drinking liquid egg whites to meet protein requirements. Um, it, it can be done. I know a lot of people make a big deal out of it. I eat raw whole eggs every day. Um, sometimes I'll put them in with raw milk and then like a scoop of collagen. Um, I don't ever like crack them in my mouth like I'm Rocky, but um, it has happened. Uh, that being said, a lot of people believe that there is people smarter than me that really have a thorough understanding of the human digestive system, think that that's problematic. So my take is like, why do it? I guess if you're in a super hurry, um, you could you could go that that route and it's not it's not going to harm you, I don't think, unless it may cause some type of gastrointestinal distress. But, um, you know, it will get digested. I just don't I, I don't see necessarily the reason why. I mean, it, look, take have a protein shake if you're in that big of a hurry or cook those egg whites. Um, mix in, I do six to one, six egg whites to one whole egg if I'm eating it. Um, tastes great, scramble it, a little salsa. Um, and Bob's your uncle, as they say, down under. Um, so I, I, I don't, you, there's no advantage to doing it by, by drinking the liquid egg whites. I don't see any major health problem. I've certainly done it, I'm fine. Um, but I do think that if it could be avoided, if, if it's not for the sake of convenience, which in, in which case I would say just have a protein shake, um, 
then just cook them because also it, it tastes better. Uh, and if you just hate the taste of egg whites, then just stop having egg whites. Let's opt for something else, you know? That's, a, that's one thing that I will always, you know, it's a, it's a horse that I don't mind, even though it's very dead, I don't mind beating it over and over again. You can have maximum levels of performance and maximum levels of progress in your physique without having to eat things that you don't like. You know, barring the extreme, if you're like, well, I only like fast food, that's it. So what do you mean? Uh, but what my point is, is like people think that you have to have chicken breast and broccoli or tilapia and that's it. Or, and if I don't eat those things, I'm screwed. Not true. Find the things that you like that it's going to give you a great balance of micro and macronutrients and keep you at your calorie set point, making sure you get high enough protein. And it doesn't matter if you love red meat, eat lots of red meat. If you love if you love chicken breast and, and, and white fish, then, you know, go for it. If you hate eggs and hate egg whites, then don't eat egg, eggs and egg whites. There's plenty of other fantastic protein options. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Shy Ann 8. When? Love line reunion, please. Drew and I have talked about it a lot. You know, and now Drew is working with Tom Segura and Christina Pazitsky out here in Austin, Texas. I'm, I'm not in Austin directly, but I'm in the area. Um, and, you know, Drew's coming out to Austin quite frequently. Uh, we just did an episode together of his show, Dr. Drew After Dark, when he came out here um, about three or four weeks ago. Um, and we, we've talked about it. We've tried to figure it out. Look, there's, there's, there's loopholes. First off, for four or five years, someone else was doing Loveline. I mean, obviously, Drew and I could do our own advice show, but we couldn't use the name Loveline. So now that that failed, as it apparently should have, I, I, I never... And I, and I hate to be that guy because I don't have any personal ill will or resentment towards anybody who tried to host that show after Drew left. Um, but from what I understand, Loveline's, it wasn't Loveline. You know, first off, there wasn't a doctor there. And secondly, there wasn't a funny person there. So, you know, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm uh, George Carlin or anything or, or, you know, Richard Pryor in his prime, but... I was I was the kind of everyman as as Corolla was he you know and he was the greatest and Drew was a literal physician and that's kind of the basis of what made the show go, um, and not having either of those two things made f for a different beast and it was kind of weird that they would call it Loveline and I never really got any positive feedback about that but that show has ended so Drew and I have talked about it so we investigated it apparently. The ownership of the name Loveline is a very convoluted, gigantic mess. So that has posed problems. Um, but we're intrigued by the idea. We like the idea. We want to do it. We love working together. And we feel like there's a desire for it. I certainly, there's no end to the amount of tweets and DMs and things that Dr. Drew and I get regarding more Loveline. People want more Loveline. So... Uh, let's see here. What schedule should someone take up after taking years off from lifting weights? Sets, intensity, etc. I work construction and would like to avoid, avoid delayed onset muscle soreness from, uh, well, that name is a bunch of stuff. Uh, it's a great question. And I, I, first off, would like to congratulate you on making that decision. Um, I think that much like uh, wealth, I think that making lots of money is, uh, you know, coming from nothing and making lots of money is really admirable. And it's, a, it's amazing when someone can do that. But equally as impressive is when someone made a lot of money, lost it all, and then can get back onto their feet and make lots of money again. Um, because it's, it, it can be uh, really hard to resuscitate something that went away. It can oftentimes be a lot harder than starting anew. So I congratulate you. Um, I think it's a great concern, especially because you have a very active job. If you're working construction, if you're a mail carrier, if you're um, you know, an ER surgeon, if you're uh, an athlete uh, a skill of a skill sport, um, the last thing you wanna do is spend your life you're hardly able to walk because you did such a high amount of volume and intensity in the squats the day before, you know what I'm saying? Um, and that's a big mistake, uh, not to deviate or, or to uh, digress from your question, but you know a lot of athletes, especially athletes of strength sports like football, 
um, combat sports, you know, wrestling, MMA, boxing, jiu-jitsu, um, they, they make the mistake, hockey, obviously, and uh, rugby, you know, strength sports, sports where strength and power are imperative. They make the mistake of training like a bodybuilder to build their muscles in order to apply it to their sport. Now, if you're a hobbyist in both, it can be, it can work out. You just have to deal with it. I do that. You know, I, I oftentimes have compromised my ability to grow as a grappler or as a, a striker because I've been training so hard in the gym. I've, I've, I've created so much soreness and so much, um, damage to my muscle cells that it, you know, it's, it's hard for me to walk, let alone, you know, get down and, and like sprawl for a takedown or whatnot, you know? Um, but I'm not someone who's ever going to make a check fighting, you know, and, I, and, and my appearance as far as my physique goes is, is important to me. So, you know, I, I understand the trade-off. But if you're in a college athlete or a competitive athlete, that can, that can pose problems. Um, and uh, Pavel Tatsalin and uh, Frost Sahabi, I also have heard talk about this in, in great detail, and they make a lot of sense. Now, when you're training for sports performance, the last thing you want to do is to push yourself to the point of extreme soreness. Now, extreme soreness is going to be ne a necessary evil if you're looking to grow gigantic muscles for the bodybuilder, for the strongman, for oftentimes uh, powerlifters, depending on their weight class. It's just something you have to deal with. Um, so if, if your number one priority is looking like a monster, just know like there's going to be those moments where your upper back and your legs and shit and your chest are so sore that it's going to compromise your quality of life. Um, some people learn to love it. I, I, I certainly have. Uh, later in life, I have. When I was 20, 30, it was hard you know, because sometimes one time I, I literally couldn't get off the toilet, um, you know. And there's like there there is that bit of satisfaction knowing that you went that hard, but that also it's like it takes its toll, you know. But now I, I really kind of learned to appreciate that pain. Um, but I also don't work construction. If I did, I would want to make sure that how I pay the bills is my number one priority and I can't compromise that, okay? So you should work in lower rep ranges with higher weights. Now, higher weight is obviously relative. I don't want you to be in a rush to go to weights that are too heavy because obviously that's going to cause even more pain than delayed onset muscle soreness. That's gonna cause actual physical pain from an injury. And that would probably set your work life back a lot more than having sore muscle cells. But working in the three to six rep range is definitely where you're going to reap a lot of the benefits. You're going to gain strength, which is the most useful and versatile training kind of, um, it's the most useful uh, adaptation you can have from resistance training. Strength can carry over to power, can carry over to endurance, much more so than in the opposite direction. Um, if you can build your strength, your strength base, it can help you in every facet of your life, especially if you're working construction. Um, so strength is developed in that three to six rep range. Um, I would stay away from absolute failure because that's where you're going to, or even flirting with failure is where you start to get that maximum level of soreness. I can squat tremendous amounts of weight it, relative to me, my, what would be my 90% plus in, when we're measuring against my one rep maximum. And I can do that for three to five reps and not be sore at all, really. You know, there's that feeling of fatigue from my central nervous system. But I'll, um, yeah, I just finished a strength block training in lower rep ranges and I was lifting at super heavy weights for me um, pretty consistently, three, four days a week and I, I just didn't have any soreness. Now, as soon as I switched back into a more hypertrophy-based, higher volume uh, modality, I'm sore as fuck, like really sore. I did 20 rep squats last Friday, and I'm still sore right now as I film this, it's Sunday. Um, and it, it, that's the way it is. And I was pushing it to, you know, within one, two, or zero reps in reserve, if you really believe that I could get there. I'm not sure I, I got to absolute failure, which would be zero reps in reserve, but I was certainly flirting with it. And that's where you start to get that maximum levels of soreness. So my best advice to you is train heavy, but train in a lower rep range, three to six reps, and um, 
train with at least three reps in reserve, meaning if zero reps in reserve is absolute failure, stay about two to three reps away from that. Get to two to three reps before you, you, know, you know you're gonna hit absolute failure. So you start to feel the fatigue, um, you start to feel that strain, and then you recognize that it's time to put that down. That actually is act gonna be more beneficial for development of strength long-term, but it doesn't give you that immediacy, that, that sense of like accomplishment, you know, where you get dizzy and you get that incredible hormone rush. And that's okay, um, because you're gonna be getting stronger, you're gonna be helping yourself live longer, you're gonna m be increasing your, all your health markers, and you're gonna feel better. And you're actually gonna feel better. Training should make you feel better. And oftentimes, I'll be very honest with you, training for hypertrophy, for real hypertrophy, training to be a fucking monster makes you feel like shit. You know, that's the trade-off. Um, just like I love jujitsu, I love wrestling, I love boxing and Muay Thai, I love it. Training to fight, to, to, to you know, I love, I can train three, four days a week, four or five days a week sometimes if, you know, my wife's out of town and I have the, the luxury of time on my hands. I love it. It's a buzz. When you're actually going to step into a ring, octagon, or get on the mats to compete against someone, that training, going into that, make you feel horrible. <laughs> You're so tired, you're so beat up. And, and, but that's what you have to do, right? If you wanna be successful. So those are your trade-offs. If you wanna look in the mirror and, and see you know, some facsimile of Dwayne The Rock Johnson, just know that it, it, it's gonna make you feel awful sometimes. But if you wanna look better, feel better, have a better life, you can absolutely train three days a week in the, in the way that I've told you and you will reap all those benefits. You will certainly look better. Um, you will certainly feel better, you will certainly have more strength, you will certainly have more energy, those types of things, um, but you won't have the fallout that comes with chasing the extremes. Dags Steven, I got back into fitness last year and I love it and it has played a significant role in my sobriety. Oh, congratulations, Dags. Um, with that this year, I want to push it and see what I am capable, but capable of, I think he's, he or she's meaning, between training and nutrition and everything uh, and everything. What if I would, first off, I would recommend looking into uh, some type of doubling down on your grammar and your understanding of punctuation and the English language as a whole. Um, see what I'm capable of. Between training and nutrition, everything, what advice do you have about balancing fitness and your program of recovery, which I'm a part of a 12 step fellowship? Any advice? Well, help, thanks. Um, it's a great question, and sincerely, congratulations. And also, I do think that um, a, a disciplined exercise program can really enhance your recovery. They go hand in hand. My advice is to look at it as something that is not separate and that you have to work to find balance of because when you're finding balance between things, you know, if we're getting super technical, if I'm gonna get pedantic, it means that they're two exclusive objects, you know, to find the balance in weight. For me, exercise and nutrition is not something that I find balance with. It is not a mutual, it's not exclusive from my recovery. It is part of my recovery. Um, I think of it, uh, I don't think of it as part of the 12 steps because it's not literally part of the 12 steps, but it is something that I lean on just as much as I do the 12 steps to help me kind of stay centered. Um, so that's my best advice. At least that's what I've found to be most successful for me. And when I know that I'm looking at it as a piece of my recovery, I don't allow it to get in the way of me going to meetings, uh, reaching out to a sponsor or sponsoring other people, um, taking away from my research of the literature, things of that nature. I don't want to get into too much detail about the 12 step stuff. And I think you can understand that. And most people who have any familiarity know that it's not appropriate, but you, I hope you can understand what I'm saying that don't look at it as something you have to balance. Look at it as a piece of it. It's, it's, a, it's a complete whole. It's a comprehensive unit. And just like you would with um, hydration, right? You wouldn't want to just opt for not drinking any water as soon as you gave up drinking tons of alcohol or gave up doing lots of drugs um, because 
you know that it might compromise your ability to kind of stay focused in the same way that you wouldn't want to not tend to your sleep etiquette because you, you know that it might compromise your focus. I look at exercise and nutrition as the same way. Um, as I can feel myself training in a certain way, doing activities physically, and then also putting food in my body that is going to make me feel better and it's gonna help me grow as a human, um, it also helps me grow as a sober person. Um, and that's, that's just the way I look at it. And uh, I don't, I used to get into trying to make a hierarchy of what's more important in my life. Can I sacrifice my relationship with my family to go to more meetings? Can I, and I think about, I don't think about it that way anymore. I just think about like, what can I do to wake up and then subsequently go to bed tonight as a sober man? And if that includes not going to a meeting today, but because I have to spend time with my daughter uh, and I don't get it to train because I'm, you know, shifting things around, so be it. But tomorrow I know that I'm going to make sure that I find a babysitter or that my wife's going to be home so that I can go to a meeting and I'm going to wake up extra early so that I can get my workout in. It, it's not, I don't have to shift things around in, in a hierarchy sense as much as I just make my schedule as if it was any other thing, brushing my teeth, going to work. All right. Unfortunately, I think that might be the last question I was given. And it is. It's a short one, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to be coming back with uh, some other stuff I wanted to talk about when it comes to the relative benefits and downsides to different levels of volume and intensity. Uh, that's going to be my next Mikey Likes You coming your way. Also... Uh, it is the new year, 2023. It's going to be a big one for all of us. I know it. I can feel it. Just believe it. Uh, my Patreon is open at all three different tiers. I'm putting together another training program to add to it. Um, if you're part of the top two tiers, you have access to all the different training programs and uh, the articles and then also the bonus pods that come your way when I have the time to do them, which I'm going to start having. Um, and then also the top tier means I can help train you nutrition, habit forming, training. It's all taken care of and you have full interaction with me. Online, Skype calls if you want, whatever, whatever works. Zoom, if that's better, brah. But check it all out. I'll put the link in the show notes below. And in this crazy mixed up world that makes you think that nobody cares, remember I do. Bye.